My name is Kevin Carey. I'm the Vice President of Education Policy uh, here at New America. Um, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon for what I know is going to be a very, very interesting discussion um, in partnership with our uh, longtime collaborators and partners, Washington Monthly Magazine, that it, which has recently published its annual college guide, um, which every year through rankings and long form journalism asks different versions of the question, what can colleges do for our country? Um, this has been a, a relationship that has been um, in place for many years. Um, and the newest edition of the College Guide, which you can now read online, um, is one of the best. So I know you'll, you'll get more information about that as the, um, as the event goes on. Um, and we are very pleased to have some of the authors and subjects of those articles join us today uh, for this panel discussion. Um, it's a really interesting time in American higher education. The campuses have been open again for a couple of years now, um, but changed um, in ways that I think we're still struggling to understand. Um, we have uh, brand new federal uh, higher education policy and uh, student loan forgiveness, potentially, uh, uh, given the various legal issues that still surround that. Um, we have uh, new ideas out there, some of which have advanced, some of which have not. Um, and meanwhile, millions of students uh, enrolling in colleges and universities around the country. Um, we have a great panel discussion here today, um, including uh, Paul Glasseris, the Editor-in-Chief of Washington Monthly <coughs> Magazine. Um, we have Jim and Deb Fallows. Um, uh, Jim Fallows, longtime uh, board member at New America. Deb Fallows, a uh, uh, several time uh, fellow um, and journalist here at, at New America. Um, we have Dr. Pam Edinger, the president of Bunker Hill Community College in Massachusetts. Um, and Elias Gomez, a student at the University of North Texas uh, at Denton. Um, but before we get to the panel, I want to introduce uh, our opening speaker, Michelle Asher Cooper. Um, who was until very recently the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Higher Education at the U.S. Department of Education, and prior to that, the President and CEO of the Institute for Higher Education Policy. Um, Michelle is now the Vice President for Public Policy at Lumina Foundation, um, which I should also note is a generous supporter of our higher education work here at New America and of the Washington Monthly College Guide. Um, so again, on behalf of New America and Washington Monthly, thank you to all of us for joining to all of you for joining us at this event. Um, and with that, I will hand the virtual microphone over to Michelle. Thank you, Kevin, for that intro. Um, I wanna thank Washington Monthly and New America for this opportunity to join in partnership. Um, as you heard, I have just uh, joined the staff of the Lumina Foundation. In fact, this is only my seventh day on the job, lucky number seven. Um, although I am new to this role, I have been a grantee and partner to this organization for more than a decade. My track record with Lumina is long because fundamentally the organization and I have a lot in common. For example, Lumina's mission of making opportunities for learning beyond high school available to everyone and its equity first focus on facilitating the success of students who are black and brown, adults and low income is something that I believe in so deeply that it has been reflected throughout my entire career. I firmly believe that our nation urgently needs to increase the college attainment of all Americans. And we need more people to have degrees and credentials that confer real value in the labor market. Another thing that Lumina and I have in common is our belief in facts and the importance of having journalists, advocates, and other professionals who share and speak to college and university leaders' responsibility in addressing the needs of today's college students. That's why the Washington Monthly and today's event is so very important. Through its rankings, the Washington Monthly highlights colleges that have a commitment to serving students and serving their local states and communities. As Kevin Carey wrote in the introduction to this year's rankings, America needs a new definition of higher education excellence, one that measures what colleges do for their country instead of for themselves. 
In this year's 2022 College Guides, the Washington Monthly explores the vital role universities can play in their communities and the innovations that ensure that learning and earning are well aligned. After all, access to good colleges and good jobs should go hand in hand. Today, quality, value, equity, and affordability are key words for higher education, but they mean absolutely nothing without action. Throughout this issue of the Washington Monthly, I was pleased to read articles that spoke to real authentic actions where students were centralized. I applaud the colleges that are featured because they are truly what Jim Fowles described as engines of individual mobility, social responsibility, and national cohesion. I believe these are the defining characteristics of institutions that offer the most value to students and society. Given this, when we talk of college rankings, we need to make sure they are about more than just bragging rights or institutions patting themselves on the back. As it stands, so many college rankings do nothing more than simply hold up institutions that Xerox privilege. That's something I got from Dr. David Wilson, Xerox privilege. Instead, we need rankings that point the way toward creating a better society. Washington Monthly, I applaud the good work that you continue to do on college rankings. And I challenge all institutional leaders to not be so fixated on the rankings. Instead, be fixated on the words that are featured on the cover of this year's college guide. What can colleges do for the country? This question is so important now at a time when people are questioning the value of higher education and at a time when we are still moving through a period of pandemic recovery and navigating inflation and economic instability. This question of what can colleges do for the country is one that I actually think about often. And in my most recent position at the US Department of Education, these were the types of questions and issues that were front and center of my work each and every day. At the Department of Education, I had a number of responsibilities and three different titles, but all of them led up to supporting a number of key priorities for the administration. For example, I led the work around the pandemic recovery efforts that were made possible by the American Rescue Plan. The American Rescue Plan kept many colleges from financial disaster. It kept the faculty and staff of those institutions employed. It kept millions of students in school and helped them with food and housing costs. And it provided academic help and financial supports to help re-enroll and re-engage many of those who stopped out during the initial phase of the pandemic. At the department, we also helped to mitigate the financial harm of the pandemic by delivering targeted financial relief to student loan borrowers at the highest risk of falling behind on their payments or defaulting on those loans. We did all of this while also working with college and university leaders like Dr. Edinger, who's here today. We were eager to work with them to raise the bar and embrace evidence-based practices to increase student retention and completion. Now that I'm here at Lumina, I hope to extend the good work and early wins we saw coming out of the pandemic. The pandemic showed us that higher education is not the slow moving enterprise that many believe that it was. College leaders showed us that they were flexible and adaptive. They were creative. They showed deep care and sensitivity toward their students and their faculties. And they moved with swiftness and urgency. Now, even though we have disposed of mass mandates, we cannot dispose of the urgency and the can-do spirit that characterized those early days of the COVID-19 crisis. After all, the crisis for many of our students did not start in March of 2022. The pandemic simply put longstanding challenges under a spotlight and infected millions more. 
I believe our actions and the speed of our actions have helped millions of students and institutions survive this crisis. The steps we take now will determine how well we learned our lessons and whether institutions will commit to serving our students and our society instead of just serving themselves. Thank you for the opportunity to greet you all today. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Michelle, uh, Asha Cooper. I, uh, for those kind words about the Washington Monthly, uh, Michelle and I know each other for a lot of years, but including uh, her leadership of the uh, Gates Post-Secondary Education uh, Commission that I served on and uh, was just uh, delighted to have you here and ho uh, hope you'll stick around for the discussion later. Um, it is uh, my pleasure now to introduce uh, another old friend, Dr. Uh, Pam Edinger. Um, uh, Dr. Edinger, since 2013, has been president of Bunker Hill Community College, um, which in 2017, the Washington Monthly uh, picked as one of its uh, 12 best colleges in America for adult learning. Um, and Dr. Edinger, when you came to uh, uh, Bunker Hill, in 2013, you inherited a nascent program called Learn and Earn. Yes. And uh, uh, when you got there, you said you were going to double it. Um, <laughs> Learn and Earn is an in paid internship program. Right. Tell us, let's just begin the story of this program that we wrote about. Laura Colarusso wrote about ably in the Washington Monthly. Why did you want to double the program? Why is Paid, why are paid internships at community colleges important? Right, so, well, it's it's absolutely my pleasure to, be, to come back, Paul, to, and have a conversation with you a second time. Um, internships, when, when folks have internships in their head, they think about, you know, students who are in their senior, junior, senior year in college, 17, 22, um, very traditional, and they do this for free, right, in order to get experience. But when you look at the, the, the sort of background of community colleges, our students um, don't have the ability to give up the jobs that they're doing to support their family or support their schoolwork in order to take up something free, right? To give somebody else free labor. So when, when my predecessor started this program, um, she insisted that, um, that the program must pay um, more than minimum wage, $15 an hour back then was a lot of money, but also a transportation stipend. Because our students, not only do they experience um, poverty in, 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 in over three quarters of our students are living in the lowest two quintile of income. Um, a, a, a ride out to their internship site would cost them three or $4. And it's close to $10 round trip. I mean, that is no longer going to school money, is food money, is money for the children. Um, it, it, is, it just eats into their, um, their ability to, to, to maintain um, their everyday living. So we insisted that it would be paid. And because these are adults, um, we, we said to our partners, you must treat them as if they're adults because they come with skills that our younger people don't. They, they're not coming to you to learn how to come to come to work on time or learn how to, how to be, how, how to be, um, how to what I call calendar integrity, right? To, to know when to show up and how to work. Um, so the program is slightly different. Our students go to these internships to experience what it feels like to be in the corporate environment. They're first generation students and going to college is not in their family background, right? Your children and mine, they learn about these things sometimes around, around the dinner table, they go to work with mom and dad, they get a sense of what it feels like in, in the office and in the professional environment. That's not always the experience of our students. So it is something different and we borrowed the traditional, I guess the traditional template of an internship and basically turned it on its head. Um, to me, the, the social capital that, and, and the knowledge capital that they gain from the internship is important, but the system was not designed for my students. So when I wanna double it, 
it, it is to be able to serve the 16,000 students that I have. Right, right. And, and, and let me just point out that there are paid internships out there, but they tend to be at you know, pretty elite four-year universities like Northeastern University with its famous uh, <laughs> uh, program. And, right. and those often lead at these schools to job yeah. offers, right? Yeah, and, and, and they, they also lead to job offers for our students. In fact, I have to confess, we stole the Northeastern model. Right, we just stole it from them. Wrong with that? <laughs> it just, just sort of made it a community college thing. Um, I, I think it, the, the more common issue is that these companies that we're approaching, right? So we're close to like 100 companies now. When, when we approach them, they don't know anything about community college students. Their understanding of a college student is traditional, right? 17 to 22, uh, mom and dad who, works and, and they, have, they have all kinds of safety nets. But our students need the same type of cultivation as, a, as folks who are going to four-year colleges because we're going to be a huge part of the future workforce, right? When you think about the jobs that are out there, three quarters of them requires a college degree. And since the community colleges have half of the undergraduates in the United States, if our students don't have that kind of training, um, we're not going to be able to stand up a workforce that would help economic development around the country. Right. So, and so that the corporations understood that, but, but you discovered something a, a couple of years in about yes. the type of students at Bunker Hill who were getting the internships. Um, it was, it was meant to uh, uh, yeah. be a, a, a way to, to take away privilege and, and you discovered something a little little off. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was it was one of my deans came to me. You know, we we had we had some iterations of this program. And one day, you know, I get a knock on a door, and and they said, "Well, look at the data, Pam. You are seventy five. We are seventy five percent diverse, right? A quarter white, quarter black, quarter lot next, fifteen percent Asian. A beautiful, beautiful, you know, sort of mosaic. My numbers." Coming out of that program, they were white, they were international students, and they were young. So what we inadvertently done by the way that we have marketed this program is to skim the top. And that's, that's, that is not okay. Um, and it's also the way that the jobs are posted, right? So the job would pose, let's say, assistant to the CEO or whatever it is. And the way that it's written, the language itself of these postings are not what our students are used to, right? And therefore, the students, when they look at these postings, they don't recognize themselves in it. Um, so they see, they, they see the Northeastern model, right? They see the same students that one would stereotypically see in their mind. So what we did- um, Yeah, yeah I, I want you to get to what we did, because I, I just want to, you know, a little spoiler alert, what you did worked. Right. We looked at the numbers yeah. and you, you, you know, you achieved over the course of a few years, uh, a pretty much an internship that r reflects the diversity yes. of your school. What are the two or three things that you did that made that happen? Right. So so we took away the fear of the unfamiliar language instead of saying to students, you got, you got to try, you got to try, you got to risk everything. You got to come try. We literally went to went to classes in which students are, let's say, studying accounting or studying whatever it is that they're studying. And we say the outcomes of this class that you just took matches the competencies that this job description look for. Therefore, you are qualified because you got an A in this class or you got to be in this class. So that's a way to convince And they needed to hear to that because they didn't see they themselves have. as qualified, right? right. Absolutely. And the flip side of that too is that the employers, that we're sending these students to were at first skeptical about how to support these non-traditional students, post-traditional students. But once they have the students with them, the work ethics of these students, the uh, I call I call it, you know, the emotional intelligence of these students who've been in the workforce, once they have the content skills, they excelled. And you know, they get job offers in the same way that the other, you know, that the other um, more typical students would. So yes, this is a success, but we really had to be mindful 
right, about looking at that data and saying, yeah, you've mimicked something that people say are good, but are you doing it well for your students? So, so you were able to pull this off because you had corporations willing to put money into the pay of these students. And also, I believe you got some foundation funding for that. Right. So initially, because of the way that internships are, are marketed, what, the business partners came right away, right? The corporate business partners came right away. But then folks knocked on, knocked on our door and said, well, how come you don't have any internships for civic organizations or cultural organizations? Well, it's because they couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford to do the $18 an hour deal. So what we did at the colleges, we went out and we fundraised with foundations so that we can, we can do cost matching. Right. We would pay for half and then the museum would pay for half so that we could bring these students into an environment that, you know, typical internships at a corporation won't give them. Not everybody wants to be a business major. Right. This is one of the reasons why you got a more diverse student body taking advantage of it, because not everybody wants to go work for Goldman Sachs or, or exactly. Lockheed Martin or whatever. Right. And, you know, we had some amazing partners that the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston gave us all of their internships, every single one. So we have like over 10, 15 internships and it changed the way the museum sees students and it changed the way our students see the museum. Those students and their family would never have gone into that museum of their own accord, right? So the museum has this diversity agenda. They wanna do good DEI work and we are able to partner so that they develop a new audience and serve the community. And we're able to open up a whole new window of, of cultural offerings for our students that they would, never would have found. Okay, that's great. You, you guys have done a great job. Most community colleges are not located in wealthy cities like Boston, don't have inspirational, yep. innovative leaders, don't have the capacity to get that kind of foundation money um, what do we need at the federal policy level? Because we like to talk about federal policy here at Washington Monthly and New America. What do we need to make the program that worked for Bunker Hill work for every community college in America? Well, I think the, the, I think the um, Department of Education ought to think about partnering either with the Department of Labor or whatever the procurement work that they're doing for the federal government and make sure that, that in their procurement, they put aside money for, for internships. It's no different from apprenticeships or any of the other sort of work study kind of in, you know, programs. So build it into, build it into the, the economy or the, the normal economic workings of a city, right? Yeah, not everyone has a Raytheon in their backyard, but every city has a city hall. Every city has a historical society. Every city has a health, has a health department. So it is, it is really opening up um, the idea that these jobs that are out there that are, that are just regular paying jobs could be an internship experience for somebody. Then you can hire them, right? So, so we seem to think the internship is this tight little ball in a corner, but it really isn't. Every job that, Paul, you need an intern at the Washington Monthly. And you know, take a, take a community college student everywhere can use internships. I, I don't think we need to restrict it, but build the money into the normal streams of grants and procurement um, is not difficult. All right, well, I, I, it, it, I like the idea that it's not difficult. I hope that Washington listens to you. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Dr. Pam Manager. I think we can probably just go straight to um, uh, Elias Gomez. Um, Elias Gomez is the subject of a a wonderful story by uh, one of our uh, key writers, Jamal Abdul Alim. Uh, and this was a story about uh, a kind of a similar program. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Elias, you have a story to tell about this program and what it did for your life. You were, you were uh, in high school. And I want you to just start from the beginning. What happened um, when you were in high school and somebody came along and said, hey, um, there's a program for you. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Okay, so it actually starts before high school and kind of into elementary, actually. So this is a, a long-term thing. In elementary, we had took a field trip to UNT Denton. And one of the tour guides had mentioned that they were doing high school and college at the same time. And this is roughly like around third grade for me. And it stuck with me. I remember going back home and telling my mom that I want to do something very similar to that. I would like to go ahead and do college and high school and high school at the same time. That's called dual just... enrollment, right? And they had this program, dual enrollment at the Dallas schools. Yes. And you're, so, a, you're, you're, you're in third grade at the time. Yes. So this is still something new at that moment back then. It was something new. So as time went, as time continued and my mom worked for the city of Dallas and she had mentioned to me that the DISD, Dallas Independent School District, was having this program where they're allowing high school students starting their freshman year also become college students for a community college. And so I had told her my plans of me wanting to make video games. And she had found one of the schools that was offering that program, the dual enrollment. And they're... Their field of study was video game technology. So it was almost lined up perfectly for me. So, so you're in high me. school now. I'm in college now. No, no, I but, but when this when this video game opportunity came about, taking a course in video game technology, you were in what grade? I was in middle school going into high school. Gotcha. And so then you go to high school and you're involved in dual in this dual enrollment program. Um and uh, over the course of your high school years, you're in high school, but you're taking college courses, right? Yes. And what else did the program provide? Not only did the program provide you know, college hours, but as well as plenty of internships and shadowings. The internship that I received, the first one I received was a um, game testing internship from a small company known as Magnet and Associates. Uh, Mr. Magnet, he is a game developer who works real closely alongside my school. And he is known as an industry partner for us. And so he would come every Friday. And I remember one of these meetings that he had went to, it was uh, during the peak of COVID when we we're all doing online classes. And I remember just having plenty of questions for him, just asking him, like, how's the gaming industry going to continue to move forward? How has COVID impacted the gaming industry? And he liked that I came with so much enthusiasm that he offered me an internship on the spot. And this was a paid internship. Yes, it was a paid internship. And, and, and so then you're continuing to take that job. And, and then was it in your senior year? This is, by the way, the program is called P Tech, right? Yes, P Tech. P Tech, and and your senior year, you get a different job with IBM. Tell us about that. Yes. So from my junior year going into my senior year, that summer break, we were giving a IBM internship for that for that summer, and I went ahead and applied, and you know, luckily I received it. And from there, I was being I was an intern for IBM as a consultant, being paid twenty one fifty an hour. And I remember, like, it would, it was something completely out of, like, nothing I never thought I would be doing. I never knew what a consultant was beforehand. I didn't think that. What I would. was it like the best paid job you'd ever had, like, before all this? I was working at Olive Garden, cleaning tables and greeting people. And I was being paid $10 an hour. I was thinking that was, like, money at the time. Yeah. I was going out and buying food and buying clothes. And then whenever I got the IBM internship, it completely changed my mind on how money worked. It really opened up like $10 wasn't nothing. It was just a lot at the time because I didn't know how money worked and I was still very young. And now- So you're, that so, so you're, a, you're going into your senior year, right? And the I, IBM, uh, you had this job with IBM and you graduate um, with a high school degree and 
a community college degree. Is that right? Yes. I have my associates in applied arts of science and video game technology and computer science. And you were how old? And I'm 18 as of right now. You're, you're 18 now. So, th- so you were 18 when this happened? Yes. Uh, yeah, that, that's a little ahead of the curve, young man. Yes, and I always love to bring up that I worked for IBM as well as having my associate's degree while still being 18 because a lot of people find that real fascinating that I'm still so young yet have so much experience that you know people my age are, are fighting to get as soon as they leave high school while I was getting it before I even graduated high school. And what I also find super interesting is that I actually had my college graduation before my high school graduation. So I even finished my college classes before my high school classes. And, and didn't you tell our, our writer, Jamal Abdul Alim, that your mom uh, was impressed and it changed her life, right? Yes. So she noticed how well I was doing in college compared to high school. Because to me, I felt that the courses as well as the material in college is not only a lot more beneficial, but as well as as it's a lot more easier to digest compared to high school. So, 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 you know, you were not the you were not the top student at your high school. No. So before that, my middle school years, I was in a whole different district. I wasn't necessarily the best kid. I would get into a lot of trouble. So going into my high school year, my freshman year, I was still acting up, was eating the best grades and almost immediately like the college classes like turned me around. And I ended up from being like a C average student to being a high, a high B and a low A average student. Amazing. And And now you're at the University of Texas at Denton. Is that right? Yes. University of North Texas at Denton. You of North Texas, and 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 what like what grade are you in? I'm considered a junior, <laughs> and so I'm on track of graduating next year. Uh, so I'm an incoming freshman with a, a junior credentials, and I'm on track of graduating next year as long as I take uh, five classes per semester, which is nothing compared to what I was doing in high school, where I had eight classes. And that's not even including the, my college classes. So, so what are you going to do if you get that degree? What is your aim uh, for a career? Or do you have one yet? So for the longest, I've always wanted to have my own gaming studio. I would like to create my own video games. But in a different way than other traditional um, game developers. Well, um, I have very little doubt that you are going to do precisely that. Um, Elias, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Uh, Good luck with your junior year. It's amazing. I want to turn to our next uh, set of panelists. Um, uh, Jim Fallows is a uh, uh, legendary journalist, uh, longtime (laughs) writer for the Atlantic Monthly, for the Washington Monthly. Uh, He has, is the author of about 12 books, has traveled uh, and written throughout America and the world, um, National Book Award winner, uh, and uh, many, many other honors. And Deborah Fallows, uh, a very distinguished writer and linguist, author of a couple of books of her own, former, as Kevin Carey said, uh, 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 fellow at New America and research fellow at the Pew, uh, research Center um, has written for just about every publication from the New York Times to Slate to the Washington Monthly. Um, and I got to say, both Jim and Deb are old friends and mentors and colleagues and was delighted that they uh, each wrote stories for the Washington Monthly's college uh, guide and ranking. And um, so I'm just delighted that they could be with, here with us today. And the themes of their stories really define the theme of this discussion we're having today with New America. And that is the importance of defining what higher education excellence is in terms of its return to the country, what it does for society, for our economy, for uh, upward mobility, the things that the Washington Monthly 
rankings try to measure. But in particular, and this is the new thing that Jim and Deb have sort of added to our discussion. It's always been uh, implied, but they've really articulated it in a, in a bold and beautiful way that part of the return that American taxpayers want for the hundreds of billions of dollars in tax dollars we invest as a society in the higher education system, part of what they want is for universities and colleges to, uh, to attend to the needs, the economic and civic life of their local communities. And um, so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask them about today. And um, Jim, your story uh, kind of paints the, the frames the, 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 the issue. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin with you. Um, and I have to say, it, for people who know the Fallowses, they probably know them these days best for their, for their book, Our Towns, a, a uh, fantastic tour of America by small plane, look at the uh, resilience and renewal of small forgotten communities all over the United States. And Jim, uh, and also a great HBO series, if you all haven't seen it, and you all have started a foundation, the Our Town Foundation, to, to propagate this idea of, of renewal of, of different communities around the country and how it can be done. So Jim, begin with you, uh, how did the story that you wrote about <coughs> a particular college in America and its uh, uh, work for its local community, how did that emerge from the work you and Deb did for your book, Our Towns? Uh, so Paul, thanks so much for uh, asking and thanks for for having us as part of this wonderful college issue and as part of this wonderful webinar. I need to spend 30 seconds on sort of origin stories here. So Paul, you and I and Deb are, are friends of long standing, as you know, and, and we've we worked together at US News, the name that we don't won't discuss trying to clean up college rankings in, in those days. The Washington Monthly is particularly dear to my heart as the first magazine job I ever had in my life. This was 55 zero years ago when I was part of an early cadre of staffers of the Washington Monthly. Deb was there as, as part of the Reserve Army, too. And so to be able to come back full circle also to New America, where I was part of the founding of New America as well, it is particularly heartening. This, the origin story of the, uh, the, the articles that both Deb and I have in this current great college issue is that we've been traveling around the country uh, doing reporting for our, our book, Our Towns, and, and Atlantic articles and other things. And one of our recurring themes was how much was going on that nobody had ever heard about, that there were things that people were paying attention to in their communities, in their colleges, in their public schools, in their libraries that had uh, you know traction in their own areas, but that nobody in the next county, let alone the, the next state or the, the nation as a whole, uh, had ever known about. And this had two destructive effects. One was it left people feeling kind of atomized around the country when they were doing things together. The other is that it gave people a disproportionately negative view of what was happening in the U.S. as a whole, because everybody knows about the things that are destructive and people don't know about the efforts to combat them. So in brief, we were in Muncie, Indiana, a home of Ball State University, about two or three years ago. We saw lots of innovative things that were going on there. We began writing about them. And so that was how we came up with the, the stories I was doing, uh, we, we were doing. I, about the way the Ball State has taken responsibility for the public school system in Muncie, and Deb, about way, the way the student newspaper there has taken responsibility for community news. Again, it's important renewal information that had never been written about on a national level. Deb, uh, Jim mentioned your story, and I want to I want to go to that now. Um, tell us about the Muncie Press. Like Muncie's a kind of classic American town, um, and we know that the local press around the country's uh, come on hard times. What happened to coverage of Muncie, and uh, and then tell and then. What did the college do? Because that's the essence of your story. But but it's start with what happened with the coverage of government and, and the life in Muncie, Indiana. 
Great, I will. Thanks, Paul. Um, and thanks to the Washington Monthly and New America who are part of our extended family. We're really happy to be with both of you today. So when we were, um, so the story of, of the Muncie newspaper is a pretty typical story in America. About the year 2000, the Star Press was acquired by Gannett Papers. And we know what happens after a case like that. The, the staff shrank the coverage shrank. It became a kind of shadow of its former self. And the depth of the staff in the paper was not able to, to cover local stories in the way that they used to. So it became a kind of vacuum and a gap in local coverage. When Ball State um, took over the directorship of the Muncie Public Schools, the news, the student newspaper, the daily, the Ball State Daily, saw this as an opportunity to increase their coverage. Not only were they, um, they were very, you know, professionally run student newspaper at the time, covering mostly student affairs and also a little bit of the, the town affairs like they did, but they thought this is a real opportunity to step up, to have the student journalists go in depth into the school system that their university was taking over and to report it not just in nuts and bolts, but to go into the classrooms to see what it was like in a, in a bilingual classroom for the teachers and in the context of what that meant to bilingual education around the country, to go into uh, changes that were happening in the state government like um, deciding that would civics be something taught in middle school? That was a state decision. So they decided to cover that and in, in fact, what it meant to the Muncie public schools themselves. Um, and it, it's really interesting in the context of both the internships that, that we've just heard about and Elias's story, that these student journalists saw themselves as having an opportunity to be real journalists, as they called it, and were very excited to take advantage of this and said, once they started writing these stories, they, they appreciated that they were uh, dipping their toes into the big time and providing something for the town that, that wasn't there anymore and you know providing something for themselves an opportunity to really operate at a different level from what most student journalists can do and and so suddenly the the people and it's, so if you're live in Muncie and you know that the schools are struggling and but they they've got promise and you, do you go to the do you literally go to the student newspaper website to read about um you know teacher pay and and you know other things is is it, is it something that the local folks in Muncie take advantage of and appreciate um yes it is is the answer and the students on the paper and their marketing divisions and their advertising divisions worked very hard to make that happen they they hit the pavement handing out copies of their newspaper at at local meetings um, they publish online and once a week they also publish a print version and also, you know, occasionally special editions as well in print. So they kind of infiltrated themselves into the into the uh, radar of people around the town um, and handed out their free papers. Uh, once people started reading beyond the nuts and bolts in the in-depth stories, you know, not only did they go there, but they saw they began to see their understand what was happening in their school system in a different way because the student paper had the resources to do that reporting in a different way that the local papers no longer had time to coverage. And it is, I don't know if you know the answer to this. Is there any other student newspaper that has done something like this? It happened once before. It wasn't a public university like Ball State. It was uh, so. It, it, I think you talk about newspaper, but right? newspapers have taken over the civic role. As a oh, book. newspapers taken over the civic yeah. role. Um, what's what, Jim? I, mean, I can't. You know? I can't yeah. think of an example. And there, there yeah. may be one, but but uh, I, I think it is quite unique. No, well, you know the the framing circumstances are, are unique too. And and Deb was yeah, referring to there's that. 
Yeah, there, there was one other case where a university had taken over management of the public schools, and that was in Boston a couple of decades ago when Boston University, a private school, took over the Chelsea schools in, in, in Boston. What made the Ball State circumstance um, unique is it's a public university, and there conceivably there are other instances in public records, but everybody, nobody we spoke with had ever, ever heard of them. And I think that that, that positioned the, um, the Ball State newspaper, the Daily News, to take over this responsibility. Some other college papers we've seen recognize they have some uh, peripheral duty to where, where they are. But I think there's what makes Muncie and Ball State unusual is this frontal decision by the university and its leadership, including Jeffrey Mearns, the president, whom I talk about uh, extensively in the story, of thinking that the university's welfare depends on the community's welfare. And, and so, and always the, the yes. school, the, the university took over the schools. When and why and how? So it was about five years ago. Uh, the Muncie schools had been in a sort of downward spiral, familiar to urban schools around the country, and the Indiana legislature had put two school districts in the state into receivership. One was Gary, Indiana. The other was the Muncie Community Schools. And Jeffrey Mearns, who was being hired as the new president, um, told the board that was hiring him, the president of Ball State, that he wanted to have this job only if it involved taking responsibility for the community more broadly and not just having a, a town and gown separation. So he and the university came up with essentially a surprise plan for the legislature saying, give us responsibility for running the public schools and we will take that responsibility. And they had an extraordinary process over the next year or so of involving the entire community, which is racially very diverse, economically uh, separated and polarized, to have people from all different parts of the community represented in the school board. And that was approved by the legislature. And it's now, it hasn't made the Muncie community schools like the richest public schools in the country, but the trends have all been positive. That's fascinating. And and so when you look, Deb and Jim, at, at what's happening at in Muncie with Ball State, is this a one-off? Is this a, a lovely example of, 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 a, of a good thing that a university did? And, you know, good for them, but it doesn't really tell us much about the role of universities or or there's no trend there. It's just a, a, a kind of a you know unique moment. So we asked exactly that question. Uh, one reason why you and I get along so well <laughs> to the people at Ball State and other places. And they said uh, that lots of people around the country are trying to turn sort of episodes into a trend of recognizing that that uh, university welfare really does depend on both. It depends on community welfare and there's leverage for community welfare. So I, I mentioned in my piece a couple of sort of episodic examples. For example, in Dayton, Ohio, which has had very, various you know, sort of Rust Belt challenges, you have a very large community college, Sinclair, working with a fairly prosperous private university, the University of Dayton, together to invest downtown and to say that we are Dayton, we are moving ahead. Across the state of South Dakota, a very ambitious uh, community college called Lake Area Tech is really just transforming sort of the work, uh, the works, uh, working face of, of South Dakota. Mentioned Colby College up in Maine, which a hundred years ago was saved by the mill workers of, uh, of their town of Watertown, Maine. And now they're finding ways to say that, okay, the, the welfare of Watertown depends on us at Colby. So I think we are seeing and trying to make a movement of uh, colleges at all levels, research universities, private colleges, two years, four years of thinking, our future is together. So this requires a kind of boldness on the part of a university leadership. Um, we do not live in an age where university presidents like to be bold. Uh, as you mentioned, Jim, uh, this is a walking on eggshells time for university presidents. That we had a one false move, and they can they can be uh, 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 hung up to dry for for the for the wrong statement. Um, why now? So why now? Because the need is great. I think as the the Washington Monthly and New America and their different ways have chronicled for years. 
one of the great problems of the U.S. is place-based inequality of having opportunities be in such a handful of places and trying to uh, you know, spread that opportunity. Colleges and universities are ideally placed to have a fairer distribution of place-based opportunity around the country. And so we think while there are a lot of universities and colleges where you would never want to be the president because you have all, you have to deal with the students and you have to deal with the, the the faculty and you have to deal with the trustees and you have to deal with the donors and they all you don't have control over any of them. You know, being president of the U.S. is hard, but at least you have some control. Being president of a college is 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 really hard. We think it's important to call out those presidents uh, and leaders of universities who are saying we're going to take these risks. We're going to do these things. We're going to say we can make a mark. And this can be an era of some university leaders who recognize this need and opportunity for their institutions to help remake America in the places and for the people who need it most. Well, I, I don't want to hog this discussion. I think that there are some others uh, here with us who want a piece of this and, and want to ask you some questions. And you might want to do the same of of them. So if it's possible for Michelle Asha Cooper and Kevin Carey to rejoin the discussion, um, uh, I, I want to open it up. Um, first of all, uh, Kevin, I um, want to give you the opportunity to maybe ask the first because you're my partner and and uh, I really appreciate it of, of, of Jim and Deb and what you heard. Yeah. Um... I mean, it's again. I everyone who's watching online, I really recommend you take some time to uh, uh, read the article that Jim and Red, Jim and Deb wrote. Uh, it's uh, fantastic and really interesting. I'm a former resident of uh, Indiana um, and uh, uh, enjoyed my time. Used to work for the state senator from Muncie. Um, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I think the the question I would I would kind of there's this question of leadership that comes up a lot. Um, and I think as, as journalists uh, or people who are involved in journalism, as I might like describe myself, um, you know, uh, there are compelling stories to tell that are often leader driven. Um, uh, and you find, a, you know, a, a this person or that person and, and implicit in the storytelling is if, man, if we only had another, another 500 Pam Edingers or another thousand of these guys or women, um, uh, you know, we could we could turn this ship around, but of course, exceptionality is often a bias that's kind of built into the stories that are told. Um, and I wonder if if the subject of your story was reflective about that at all. And I mean, and there are like fifteen other public universities in Indiana alone, some of which are many of whom I'm sure are particularly the regional institutions are dealing with these, some of these same issues. And so. You know how to how to manage that would be a question I would I would ask. So that, that that is a very important question, and thank you for raising it. And we've thought about this a lot because there is, uh, as as you all know from New America and from the Washington Monthly, and everybody who is on this this seminar um, understands there are very few things in life that are purely leader driven, and leaders really matter when they can have followers and the million people who are never going to be the subjects of magazine stories and people who feel as if there isn't us. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that that's what uh, leadership re re really means. So on the one hand, that is true. And stories about um, warfare that are only about generals are not really uh, uh, not fully accurate. On the other hand, generals do matter and leaders do matter in setting a, a, a tone. Um, Paul and I, everybody involved with the Washington Monthly has often reflected on the difference that Charles Peters, the founder of the magazine now in his mid nineties made by force of will and force of example. And so I think that the trick is, so for us, you know, all of us broadly in writing about these trends, I think the challenge is to recognize uh, both sides of that, that there are leaders, but they matter when they can uh, inspire others, that when they can create a movement and not just th th themselves. And certainly I know that Jeffrey Mearns and his wife, Jennifer, at Ball State and their team uh, in the community and the university recognize this as a profoundly community project for them of trying to make sure all parts of the community are represented and that they are trying to think of what are the ways to have a to, to, to have a movement. And there are various ways in which 
you know, uh, Michael Crow at Arizona State, who has gotten a lot of attention himself, has been talking about uh, new models of, of education around the country. And other people have done um, other things. So Kevin, I'll throw this back to you. My sense is um, the point of writing about leaders is, in, is hoping that one create, can create some examples, some movement, some people who are moving in the same direction. Uh, what, what, what do our, our other panelists think about the ways you can use leader stories to create a movement? Well, you know, I'm going to ask that question of Michelle because she's yeah. uh, not only been a leader, she's been working with leaders, uh, you know, in government and in the nonprofit sector. And uh, uh, totally curious, Michelle, what your experience has been. It, it, you know, that is, is this you know, do, do you see innovations like this? Do you see really breakout uh, cases of colleges doing the right thing without kind of one of a kind leaders? Rarely, uh, <laughs> rarely. Uh, I think you're. I think you're spot on. Leadership matters, and and there's leadership at different levels. You know, oftentimes when we hear about the stories, we hear about the president, as you just said. Um, but you know, they're, they're the deans and the vice presidents and the RAs, like leadership matters at every level to move these types of campus changes that, we, that we're talking about here. There's a level of leadership that I don't think we talk enough about that's, that's critically important and that is trustees and, and, and board of governors. Like they matter a lot. Very often in many cases, these individuals do not have deep higher education background. Some do and some don't. Some are from business and industry, some are from communities. And so it's important to have people on those campuses who can help fill in those knowledge gaps and really help them understand what are the realities of today's students. Um, many of them are far removed from you know, college days. And so relying on their own experience might not be reflective of the needs of the students that are on the institutional campuses today. Um, but overall, do I think leaders matter? I absolutely think so. But Paul, you mentioned something in your comments earlier, your, your Q&A discussion. It is a very challenging time to be a good leader. And I think we need to also be thinking about not, how, not only about how we uplift those who are showing that they care and celebrate their successes, but we need to find the supports and resources to keep them in those roles doing good work because they have a very challenging, incredibly difficult 24 hour on job. And we need to make sure that we're putting them too on a path of sustainability. Uh, you made a great point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, jump on it, but I wanna just say to the audience today, um, we're gonna have it, we're having a discussion. We're, we're happy to talk all for, for, for forever, but we would like your questions. So feel free to uh, fill them out in that Sligo box, and we'll see them, and and we'll ask the we'll ask yeah. our distinguished guests uh, some of your questions. Um, Michelle, I wish Dr. Edinger was here, yeah. because that program that she talked about, Learn and Earn, was the brainchild of a trustee. It's a guy named Bill Swanson, who was the CEO of Raytheon, and about the only CEO I've ever heard of who started out at a community college. That's right. And, yeah. and he knew what community colleges could do and should do, and he put that thing together. So your point that you get leadership, you know, from the bottom to the top it, it is a good one. Um, now, Jim, you and I have talked about this. So it's, it's great to have leaders, but sometimes you need, to, you need some kind of a, oh, I, one other point I wanted to make. You talked about Charlie Peters. Charlie Peters is watching today. Uh, I, uh, Hi, Charlie. And, and, and you know, presuming, presuming we were able to help him log on. So Charlie, Beth, uh, great to have you. Um, there's leaders and, then, and, and maybe they're rare, but there's things that can be done to uh, initiate action, to inspire action, or to threaten with, that if there is no action, there will be consequences. Um, that can come from... Uh, that can come from the trustees, that can come from the state legislature that holds the, the uh, reins of the budget of a, of a public university, and it can come from a college rankings. 
So, you know, let's talk a little bit about college rankings and, and, and Jim and, and, and Deb also. You, is it possible to measure a college's contribution to their local civic and economic life in a way that we can rank Ball State against IU, against Mizzou, against Harvard? That's that's a, a great question. I'm going to buy some time for Deb to have her answer. Deb, of course, is a former admissions officer at Georgetown University, who has that part of her her her, her background. Um, by saying, oh, I want to respond to one thing that Michelle said, and then something else you, you were saying, Paul. I agree entirely with Michelle about the role of trustees. And again, something that is really remarkable in a lot of the universities I was mentioning, um, no, notably at Ball State, but also in Dayton and some of these other places, the way the leadership of the university has cultivated the trustees too to have a a shared um, commitment and again using the military analogy a successful military force needs civilian command leadership it needed franklin roosevelt and winston churchill it needs inspired generals it also needs the lieutenants and the sergeants and i think all these things it's leadership thoroughly is all these these things together of the outside stimuli i think it is really true that you can see the distorting effect over the last generation plus of bad college rankings where people have billboards saying we're number 12 on the regional rankings for us news and this or that way and you can see that that drives things they do uh, in a in a pernicious way I think a better sort of ranking, which the monthly has pioneered over the past a dozen years or so, has really made a difference and can in this regard. It's hard to have a measure of civic engagement that's as precise as endowment totals or incoming test scores or whatever, mm -hmm. but you can think creatively about if you were going to measure this, what would you do? And you can come up, I think, with some signs of do they have that does does the student newspaper cover this or that um, you know in, in the town? Do, does the board of trustees have representation from community members? Uh, are there you you could think of a dozen or more uh, metrics that would give people some incentive to move in that direction? Uh, I'm not going near college rankings, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is your that's that's up to you right now. But I, I wanted to go back for a minute to to the leadership question. Um, you know, what we saw at in Muncie and in other places, I think, at, uh, besides Ball State, is, is the spillover effect of having a really strong, confident leader. And that also means turning over that sense, of inspiring and turning over that sense of confidence and um, ownership to other people in the university. Uh, there's a there's a very creative, growing, strong internship program in at Ball State where just a, a, a huge proportion of the kids go out into Muncie, you know, to extend the footprint of what the university is doing in the town and uh, kind of cementing that relationship between the town and the university. Likewise, similarly. It probably wasn't an accident that when um, Muncie when Ball State took over the Muncie schools that the university that the students in the newspaper thought maybe we should do something here. It was that inspiration of strong leadership and that and that spark of well we can do something too that spills over in and creates a whole ecology of of the place. You know, uh, just a, a little bit more on the rankings. One of the <laughs> three ways that the Washington Monthly measures colleges is, you know, it's upward mobility. Are they allowing students to uh, stay in the middle class or enter the middle class by providing uh, reasonably priced degrees that mean something in the market, bring in a return? It's research. Are they creating the scholarship and scholars to drive the economy and economic growth and innovation and service. Are the students giving back to their society by participating in ROTC, by uh, participating in the Peace Corps, by casting ballots in elections? Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the measures that we have that I think is, a, is local in nature um, is we, we look at the percentage of a college's work study grants 
that they use for community service. Oh. Um, m- most colleges think of work study money as just free money that they can put students to use in service of the university. But when the enabling legislation for work study was done, it says right there a portion, and they didn't specify which, how much, a portion should go for community service jobs. And so we hold them to it. Um, would love to consider continue to talk about how we can add more measures of the local. Um, but but you know, I wanna I wanna ask um uh michelle uh put michelle a little bit in the hot seat you've just michelle come out of the 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 administration and uh i was very interested to hear of the work that you did i had frankly underestimated just how much the department of education and the biden administration had to do just to get over covid we've all kind of put that out of our minds. Um, but uh, uh, there, going forward, going forward, what is the, what is in your opinion, in your informed opinion, the agenda of the Biden administration when it comes to the issues we've been talking about today, the upward mobility, the openness to, um, finding new ways for students of modest means to succeed in the job market as well as at school um, to, to uh, enable uh, you know, more civic engagement. Um, t- tell us a little bit about what you think, where the Obama administration is at. Um, so as you know, I'm, not, I'm no longer there. And between that job and this job, I took a little time off. So I am no longer privy to insider information about where the strategy is going. But if I know something about president and our secretary of education and our undersecretary as well, I know that there's going to continue to be a commitment to students and especially those students who have not been well served by our society. Um, There will continue to be a commitment to work with colleges and universities about how to reimagine Uh, education and to see this moment as we come out of the pandemic as an opportunity for long lasting change. You know, as I mentioned in my remarks, the challenges that we see in COVID were not new for many students. You know, there were many students who were already facing food and hunger insecurity. Now with COVID, there are many more. Um, There were many students who were struggling academically. Now with the learning loss of COVID, there are many more. So those are issues that are going to continue to be front and center for our college leaders. And we're hoping, you know, at Lumina and I'm sure in the administration that we can figure out ways to continue to keep the momentum, that creativity, and that urgency front and center so that students can reap the benefits of this moment. Like that, you know, people use this statement, you shouldn't waste a, waste a, um, a tragedy or waste a bad moment. Like this is a moment. Um, and really how well we do now will define what we look like years from now. So I, I suspect that there will continue to be a commitment to supporting colleges and students in pandemic recovery. There will continue to be an interest in uplifting and celebrating uh, institutions that are uh, using evidence-based practices to support retention and completion. And there will continue to be a commitment to helping make uh, colleges accountable to students and making college more affordable for students and helping to mitigate the harmful effects of student loan debt for so many Americans. So I, I suspect that that will continue to be top of mind for those in the Biden administration. Um, but one thing I want to say that is related to the, the comments we talked about earlier about rankings and how it, we can look at it and, and think about, you know, it's sort of bigger moment, bigger things than just sort of some of the things we've been thinking about. And I don't necessarily know the nitty gritty metrics that we should be using per se, but I do know that as, as the stories in this, in this issue reflect, you know, universities have tremendous power to influence and improve their communities. Uh, colleges are often the economic engines of their towns and they really have a stake in how well those communities flourish and vice versa. And so the success of a college and the students at that college 
cannot be mutually exclusive from the success of the broader community. And so to the extent that we can think about rankings in that regard, I think it presents an opportunity for a win-win for the institution, for students, and the civic mission and broader, the, you know, the greater good um, of many of our communities. So, so uh, Paul, could I possibly just follow on what Michelle Absolutely. is? You all should ask anybody yeah. any question now. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping, stepping out as the, so I, as, I just, as, as the lead guy here. So I wanted to follow on number one, uh, Deb and I entirely agree with what Michelle was was saying that that of the various um, engines of of opportunity improvement, renovation, et cetera, around the country, institutions of higher learning are, are one of the most important. I think yes, everything that we all can do to uh, foster the sense that a college's welfare depends on the community welfare and, and vice versa is really important in changing the incentive structure. One of the really important example that maybe we can all learn from in trying to um, change the way we measure all this is happening in our nation's most populous state, my original home state of California, where one eighth of all Americans live, where there's a cabinet department of volunteerism in California. And they've had really innovative uh, a climate core there, which the Washington Monthly has written about, and a brand new college core they've written about too, which is sort of the best examples of the GI Bill and local service where people get um, significant uh, you know, benefits for, for making college more affordable in return for service you know, in their communities and in their regions. And so I think that's an important model that we can look at expanding, you know, expanding at least awareness of that and how it could be applied elsewhere. Right. And in that college core model in California, there are a couple dozen colleges at all levels of higher education who've signed on to mm -hmm. this whereby their students can be the recipients of scholarships and do this, uh, the internship work um, at the same time. So it's it's uh, getting on the bandwagon uh, among colleges and universities there to um, to move that that kind of effort forward. It's a new thing, yeah. So Kevin, feel free to jump in at any time here, but I, I want to pose a slightly uncomfortable question. Um, we all know the politics of the United States and where it's headed. And we all know that higher education policy, higher education generally didn't used to be a particularly ideological thing. Uh, most individuals, most citizens didn't know what the Republican Party's position on higher education was versus the Democratic Party's position. That is becoming less and less true. We, we now are seeing uh, uh, not only ideological differences, but in general, we are seeing public opinion uh, looking at universities, looking at a college degree with a more jaundiced eye, asking the question, is college really worth it? Is it serving my community? Is it serving my family? Is it serving the country? Um, how important, well, let me pose it the way. Can the kinds of things we're talking about, um, that we've talked about this last hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes, from paid internships to taking over and supporting public schools, can actions like this, if done at scale, change public opinion and provide more cohesion uh, more of a connection between the parties on higher education for anybody. Open-ended question. I mean, I think uh, this is a very present question. Um, to what extent are these broad issues that we've been talking about both today and for some time going to be impacted by sort of changes in the uh, ideological construction of the electorate, which as we all know is, has been and continues to be fairly rapidly uh, shifting um, very specifically around educational lines. This, this appears to be the, the, uh, the, the thing about someone that is like most predictive of whether they've changed parties or one of the most things over the last say 10 years um, where uh, uh, Republicans with college degrees are becoming Democrats and Democrats without college degrees are becoming Republicans. Um, I used to be 
more concerned. I guess I don't know if I've stopped being concerned, but I had a concern that the um, the sort of very durable cross ideological bipartisan consensus around supporting public higher education, which exists in all of our states and as exists at the federal level, um, might come apart at the financial level. Like I, I worried that the Pell Grant would get um, categorized as a, a a welfare program for the other and not not a, and therefore. You know, thrown in with other other federal you know uh, uh, poverty uh, based programs that have been marginalized or in some cases just disappeared. Um, that hasn't happened. What seems to be happening instead is that the more kind of purely cultural and ideological battles are now kind of piercing what had seemed like a very strong set of defenses around our public higher education institutions um, directly into matters of instruction and curriculum. And you can see that with the efforts of Governor DeSantis in Florida um, and in other states, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the recent bans on uh, teaching of uh, so-called critical race theory um, are, you know, very much now uh, having a direct effect on the ability of educators to teach in the classrooms. Um, and so it kind of came in a different way in another direction. Um, I don't mean to be like a downer when I say this, but I think this is a new and growing and uh, serious problem for addressing a lot of these communities because um, these are hard issues to tackle, even if everyone generally agrees on, on the outcome, right? Uh, uh, to build vibrant, effective higher education institutions that have an egalitarian purpose and serve lots of people um, it's a lot of work. Uh, it requires resources. It requires uh, various institutions coming together. It requires leadership. Um, it requires looking beyond the sort of uh, elitist perspective on the purposes of higher education that we've you know, been kind of fighting against. Um, it makes it even harder if, if the local institution is now viewed um, as a, a source of uh, radicalism or or uh, you know, uh, wrong think or things like that. Um, all of which is to say, I just think that those issues need to be kind of confronted and communities need to rally around these institutions and the educators who work there. Um, I don't think it can be shied away from. I think it's, it is unfortunately just another part of the, the solution set now, but it can't be wished aside. So, so could I follow briefly on what, what Kevin was saying, which I think is very, important and, and and I agree with what he says about the tensions and the the importance of them. I, I think they're also I, I think of the general worth itness of college and of higher ed in a couple of layers. I think for for individuals, there's been a continually changing calculation of what is worth it or not. You know, after during the uh, big college education boom after World War II, getting any college degree was a huge ticket to a different economic uh, stratum. Now there's there's all kinds of different calculations of what kind of degrees are most worth it for the individual. The way that technical degrees are suddenly much more remarkable than others. So that's one ever changing calculation for regions and localities. I think the message actually is clearer and clearer that an alliance with your college really matters, whether it's a research university or a land grant or a private school or regional community colleges or whatever, that that is becoming one of the, the markers of whether regions uh, make it or not. Um, I think it's worth recognizing that for there's a very long standing tradition in the US of the quote, college boy versus regular Joe tension in American uh, culture. That's certainly before World War II when so few people had been to college. Uh, you can think of a million movies and novels or whatever on that tension between the college snobs and the average people. So we're seeing a particularly inflamed version of that uh, now. Um, and, and I am uh, uniquely old enough on this conversation to remember the 1960s when I was in college of all the different cultural strains involving Vietnam and the free speech movement and all the rest between colleges and, and, and communities. I think the particular... Uh, to come back to the question you asked, Paul, and, and what, what Kevin was saying, the particular challenge of this moment is to keep the poison of national level culture war, uh, warfare from seeping into the management of colleges, colleges and universities who have the potential to do things that have broad local trans party appeal. And that's one of many uh, battles to, to be joined now. Yeah, and I'll jump right in. Oh, please, sorry, please. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know the, the, the right answer to your question. Certainly there are ideological tensions and they're very real. 
no matter where you are. They're very real. Um, but one of the things that I have just decided to not deter me is ideological tension um, and really stay focused on what truly matters most, and that is the students. Um, and for students, when it comes to college, you know, yes, we do hear more about, you know, is it worth it? You know, is there people say that there's a declining value? I think that means we got to tell our story better. What we know for sure is that college does reap benefits for students when they are able to enroll in good colleges, graduate from good colleges, and move into good careers. I mean, there's there's decades of, of data and, and research that show us that. What we need to do is make sure as we're opening up the doors of opportunity to millions more students who have historically been shut out, that we are making sure that that pathway still works and works well for them. And so that means that when they are in classrooms that they are actually learning and that we have good data to show what those outcomes are. And certainly we need to do a better job of being able to talk to that those outcomes and to show that data. And that shows a, a need and a, and, a, and a weakness in our infrastructure around data and really being able to speak to that. We need to make sure that when our students graduate or we need to make sure that they do graduate. <laughs> That's number one, that they need to graduate. And they need to graduate and get into a, a job that pays well and puts them on a, on a track of long-term mobility. You know, just that first job out of college, that's not sufficient. That the first job after getting that credential, that's not sufficient. It's whether or not you can be on a sustainable pathway, to take care of yourself, to take care of your family, to contribute to community. And, and, you know, as I said before, you know, access to good jobs and access to good colleges, they really do go hand in hand. Like the data also showed that, right? But we need to make sure that the students who have been sort of um, in, you know, not getting access to these things actually do have the opportunity and that they have the opportunity to, to be successful. And the, the other thing, you know, the, 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 the elephant in all these rooms that we don't always want to talk about is the cost, the affordability piece. A lot of times when people are talking about, is it worth it? They are, that is a gut instinct reaction to the cost and the debt and the burden and some feeling of debt. You know, been thinking about this a long time and, and, and you know, many of the issues that when you hear people say is not value, this is about a pocket book issue. It's like, how does it affect my finances? And if you are paying off student loan debt for 20, 25 years and still seeing the interest accrue, then yeah, you're not gonna feel like that was really worth it. And so we've got to fix this affordability infrastructure. Yes, yeah, student loan debt cancellation is one thing, and that's a good thing, I think, that's going to help millions and millions of students. But we've got to think about what happens beyond debt cancellation and how we're going to hold colleges and systems and states accountable for doing their share for making sure that this is affordable. I think if we can do that, because there was a time when we did that, if we can get back to that, then I don't think you're going to hear as much about, you know, is college worth it? I think we're gonna be able to prove that it's worth it because we'll show that people are learning, we'll show that they're earning, and we'll be able to show that in terms of how it affects their pocketbooks, it's a net positive instead of a long-term net negative. Kevin, uh, picking up on what Michelle just said, accountability, cost, um, and connecting up to what we were talking about before, which is, you know, the partisanship. Do you see a path in the next few years for the federal government or state governments, but the federal is what we know best to talk about most, to do something about accountability, to do something about cost? Um, you know, Joe Biden is famously uh, a, a, a fan of community colleges. He's married to a community college professor. He put a, uh, you know, promised to put a lot of money into community colleges, into Pell Grants, that didn't happen. And you might want to remind our readers why and why it didn't. But, we tried. but yeah, I, I, I know you all did. I know you all did. We covered it in the Washington Monthly. Uh, do you see a path for some progress on this? I certainly see a need. I think it'd be a conf confidence, confidently seeing a path to change is a dangerous assertion to me particularly these days here in DC, but there's definitely a need and particularly in light of the, um, in a strange kind of way, I think more so in light of the recent movement to um, 
uh, have a, a large scale forgiveness of student loans. You know, just one fact I've, I've been reminding people uh, of, it's only gonna take five and a half years for all the student loans to be forgiven, to regrow back to the same level that they're at now. So whoever wins the 2024 presidential election will also have $1.6 trillion in outstanding student loans on the books for the uh, Department of Education that he or she is in charge of. Um, if we don't do something to uh, 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 interrupt and disrupt and change the kind of pretty much structural dynamics of why debt happens and how much students charge, um, I don't think that the, the I think so. And, and so I think this is a, a mostly a matter of politics and priorities. I don't think this is actually a, an insolvable policy challenge um, to figure out how to properly uh, uh, subsidize and uh, regulate uh, uh, colleges and universities to control prices. Uh, states have been doing it for a long time. Some of them are still doing it now. Some of them have kind of abdicated that responsibility, but some of them have not, you know. Um, and, uh, but, you know, when the, the decisions were made over the last, you know, 13 months or so, um, this was not the priority. And, and the, you know, there are a lot of other things that this country needs, and I understand why, and the administration did fight hard for it. So um, I think those proposals could be, brought, be uh, bought, brought back to the table. Um, I would love to see them expanded to include uh, uh, regional uh, public four-year institutions like Ball State, for example, You know, many of which serve a, a pretty overlapping purpose with community colleges, many of which provide associate's degrees and, and many community colleges are providing bachelor's degrees now. So these, these de definitional distinctions are, are lapsing as the industry continues to evolve um, uh, in different circumstances. One other thing that I'll just know that I think is relevant to how we're thinking about going forward. Um, the number of freshmen graduating from high schools in this country is going to start to decline a lot in four years. Um, this is the so-called enrollment cliff um, that is an after effect of the Great Recession. Um, birth rates, American birth rates started going down rapidly after 2008. Uh, so 2008 plus 18 is 2026, four years from now. Um, it's not something anyth anyone can do anything about. You can't go back in time and change how many people were born um, 18 years ago. Um, higher education leaders are definitely aware of this and they're starting to plan for it. In some parts of the country, enrollment has already been going down. Um, I was talking just last week to a couple of college presidents who in Pennsylvania, uh, one for a, a private college, one for a regional public four-year institution. And they both said versions of the same thing, um, which kind of gets back to, you know, what both what Jim said about the ever-changing calculus of the return on investment and what Michelle said about making this case for the long term. Um, like their biggest competition is Interstate 81, um, which is a, actually one of my favorite Washington Monthly articles was about Interstate 81 and why we essentially shouldn't have it. We should have good freight rail in this country, but we didn't do that. So, um, so an enormous amount of commercial traffic in the Northeast goes up and down I-81, um, truck traffic. And so this one college that I was that I was I went to, like you literally get off the exit and there's an enormous Procter and Gamble warehouse, like a two million square foot distribution center off the exit. You go one exit up, there's an Amazon warehouse. These guys are paying twenty two dollars an hour right now. Uh, the labor market is pretty hot at that level because these are also they are in competition with colleges for the same people, um, young men and women who, for a variety of reasons, are not just locked in to the college track, which is most people, um, not the people who here, live here in DC and get to do stuff like this, but most people are not locked in, right? They're making choices. Um, $22 an hour is not bad, particularly if the alternative is debt. Um, if, the, if the alternative is uncertainty around whether you're gonna graduate from college, if the alternative is uncertainty about a good career path, not just a credential of some kind. So as Michelle said, I really, really think the onus is on everyone to yeah. strengthen that value, um, to strengthen the quality of education, and then do a better job of communicating to students what the choices are. And, and also, in a lot of ways, find partnerships with local employers. So it's not actually a binary. You don't have to choose between uh, making money in your the early part of your adult life um, and getting an education, getting on a career track. I think there are lots of ways, and we heard one of them just earlier today, um, to do both of those things at the same time. Yes, we did. And it sounds like uh, we have a work cut out for us. There's no easy, uh, you know, easy compromises to make in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, but uh, I think the work of the Lumina Foundation, New America, 
the Our Towns Foundation that is now uh, joining the joining the cause and the Washington Monthly. Um, uh, we do have our work cut out for you. I want to thank New America for uh, partnering with us on the College Guide for putting on this show. I want to thank my colleagues at at uh, the Washington Monthly, all of them. Uh, we all, everybody did a, a spectacular job with this year's issue. I want to thank the audience for for joining. I want to thank the Lumina Foundation for for its support, and um, uh, and we'll be back doing this next year after the uh, 2023 College Guide. We'll see what kind of progress we made. Kevin, any last words? No, just. Thanks so much to our panelists for joining us today um, and for the audience for tuning in. It's been, it's been a great conversation.